Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Father, we just thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to love you more. We thank you for air in our lungs, Father, that we can worship you and praise you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity while we're still on the earth to lift up a praise, to worship you, to adore you, to lay at your feet, oh God. And Father, I pray that we would never take you for granted. But Lord, that you would give us a fresh appreciation for you, Lord, tonight. Yes. A fresh love in our hearts for you tonight, Lord, in Jesus' yes. name. Yes. Oh, Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus. And we invite you. We know that you're here, but we invite you to come and to reveal yourself even yes. more to us. Yes. To manifest yourself, Lord. To make visible to us, oh God, your heart, Lord Jesus. Lord, that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have to show us tonight, Father. But Lord, you're calling us higher. You're calling us up, Father. And I pray that we would go higher. That, Father, that we would go, Father, to that upward place and dwell with you. Father, I pray for hot coals of fire. That you would place it upon our ears, Father, and upon our hearts that our hearts would burn from within at the sound of your voice. Lord, I ask you that you would take hot coals of fire and place it upon my lips, Father, that I would not speak a message, Father, from my mind or from, from my own self out of the natural, Lord, but I pray, Father, that I would lose my voice, that I'd become the voice of another, the voice of one crying in due voice in Jesus' name. Oh, Father, I'm leaning upon you, Lord. I'm leaning upon you. I'm dependent, Father, upon you, Father. And oh, I ask you that you would come and that you would reveal yourself in a powerful way, Father, tonight. Oh, Lord, change us, Lord. Let this not be just another meeting. Let it not just be another message. May we not leave this place saying, oh, that was good. But, Father, let us be shipwrecked yes. in the Spirit, yes. changed and altered. Father, I pray that you would just deal with our hearts tonight, Father. Father, in a very intimate and a very special way that we would grow in you tonight like never before. I'm asking you, Lord, that you would cause me to grow, Father. Lord, I have not arrived by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm asking you for the more, Father, tonight. I'm asking you for the more tonight in Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's good to be back in Du Bois. Good to have you back. Amen. I told Diane today as we were traveling up this way, I said, I have now officially lost count on how many times that I have been in Dubois. But I still remember the first time I heard about Dubois. I still remember. I was in Herkimer, New York at a Walmart. And across my messenger came a message from this precious one here, my friend. Crystal, inviting me to come on up to Dubois, and the rest is history. <laughs> We've been coming many years now. Yeah. We've seen many stages of growth here, yes. and it's exciting to see. It really is. So we always feel like we're coming home, and we always look forward to the special times we get to share with your pastors as well. We always have a good time. You know, sometimes you go places, you have to kind of work at the conversation, not when we're all together. <laughs> Amen. We, we always want more time, more time. 
because we just, it's good to be with friends of, of like spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we're thankful that you're here. We're thankful that we're here this weekend and we're trusting and praying. We have a team of intercessors that have been praying and asking the Lord that he would do something very special in our midst. Yes. We really want this. So we have yes. people praying from other countries <clears throat> for you Thank that you are God. here. Thank you God. And we're trusting God that your life is going to be altered. I told Diane, I said, I, I, I don't want to just travel to travel. No, I'd rather just stay at home. If I'm just going to be a talking head that goes and entertains people. That's it. I want the spirit of God yeah. to arrest us. Yeah. For the manifest presence to come and for your life to be changed. We were in Long Island last weekend and oh, we had powerful services. The Lord was there. We were there for two, two days and uh, I think there was four, four messages that we were able to get, four different services that we gave. And the Lord, oh, he showed up. He showed up. There was deliverances that happened. There was manifestations of the enemy that we took authority over. People were set free. Oh, the Lord came and touched people's hearts. People were weep. I mean, it was just a beautiful thing. And it happened in a basement chapel. Wow. This dear sister in Deer Park, Long Island, dedicated her basement many years ago to the Lord. And she has a little pulpit down there. And, and people come from far and wide to her house and they all sit down in the basement wow. and uh, we have worship down there and then we minister down there and God shows up you know he doesn't mind at all that it's a basement he doesn't care that it's not a crystal cathedral he comes and walks through the basement and he touches hearts and lives I've often said Lord if you'll come and allow yourself to be born in a manger with animals Will you not allow yourself to be revealed in the basements, in the garages, in the storefronts, and out in the city streets? And Lord, would you do it again? See, I believe that there is a great, powerful move of the Spirit coming. I'm going to give the conclusion of my message right now. And then we're going to backtrack. There is a powerful manifestation of the presence of God that is going to occur on the earth. There is going to be a great move of the Spirit like you have never seen before. And I know you've heard that many, many times. I'm a third generation pastor on both sides of the family. And I've been in church nine months before I was born. And I've heard millions of sermons. And I've heard about the great move of God, but I'm telling you, we're on the threshold of the great move of the Spirit. There is a great move of the Spirit. Because the Lord has saved the best for last. Is he not concerned about those that are lost right now? Is he not concerned about those that do not know him? Those that are, that are mixed up with their beliefs. Yeah. Is God a, a woman or is God a man? or is God, uh, These people are messed up. Yeah, that's true. Well, my way is this. And, and they look at me and this is my God. And America has never been so messed up. Yeah. We were founded on Christian principles. But yet now people have invited Eastern religions into their home. It's cool to meditate. It's cool to do yoga. It's cool to do Reiki. It's cool to be in the new age. It's cool. They think it is. They don't realize that Jesus, the precious master, his eyes that blaze like fire, loves them with an everlasting love. He cares for them. Every hair on their head is numbered. He tenderly calls them by name. He died just for them. The coolest thing you could ever do is lay down your life for him and receive the free gift of salvation. So there is a great move of God coming. And the great move of God will bring a great harvest of souls. A great harvest. There's going to be millions and millions of people saved. Why? Because the Lord is not willing that any should perish 
but all should be coming to repentance. What you've seen in the second great awakening is wonderful. And the first great awakening with John Edwards is wonderful. But there's a third great awakening coming. There's a great move of the spirit that's coming. But before the great move of God, first there will be a holiness revival. There will be a holiness revival. Right now, a book that I just finished is being edited. And the book is on the great holiness revival that's coming to the United States. The great holiness revival. The Lord showed me that he is coming. That he's blowing on his church. He's breathing on his church. He's loving his church. And he's calling his church up into a higher level with him. Why? Because he's trying to bring a cleansing to his church. Why? Because he's preparing his church to be end time messengers used during this end time visitation for the in gathering of souls. Yeah. Who's going to win all these people to the Lord? It's people in the church. Are people in the church ready right now for that? Well, he's getting them ready. Yes. He's blowing on them yes. right now. Yes. He's moving on them. Yeah. He's moving on them. So there's a great holiness revival that's coming. I believe that with all my heart. Yes. There's a spirit of repentance that's coming. Why? Because the Lord is preparing and getting us ready for this great move of the Spirit. So, I said all of that to end my message, now to go all the way back. Okay, now we're starting. Would you like to see that backwards? I hear two calls. Two calls over the land two great calls over the land the first great call that I hear is like a siren it's blowing very very loud and this great call is the call to bridal intimacy it is the call to bridal intimacy. Mm. Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. And it says in verse number 2. Go and shout in Jerusalem streets. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. How you loved me and followed me even through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of my children. I remember, says the Lord, how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. The Lord spoke to me and he said, I am releasing a bridal intimacy love over my church because I remember how she was in the beginning I remember says the Lord how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago how you loved me and followed me even through the barren wilderness Lord Jesus give me the words to communicate this in Jesus name the Lord loves his bride so much. And he's calling his bride upward. Yes. He's trying to get her attention. Because he wants to give her a fresh intimacy. A fresh love for him. Why? Because you cannot give that which you do not have. How can we tell everyone in the world that Jesus loves them if we don't have a huge love in our heart for him? I think as time has gone on, some of us, 
We say that we love God and we do love God, but yet our love for God is not as hot as it used to be in the beginning. You see, I remember when I was at Pinecrest, I remember my last year of Pinecrest in 1993. That was the Bible school that I went to. I remember looking out my dorm room window and people were getting ready to get into their cars and go out to the malls and go and do this and go and do that. And I said, Lord, no, I don't want to go. I just want to just love you all evening long rather than a Friday night spending that out in the mall. I want to spend it with you. And I would walk my dorm. I could remember I'm a, I'm a third year student getting ready to graduate and I'm walking saying, Jesus, I just love you. Give me more love for you. And it felt like, like my heart was going to burst. It was going to burst. And I can remember going home when I graduated and my dad, he was the pastor and he made me the associate pastor and the, the youth pastor. And I, I can remember going to the church late at night and turning on a little light on the stage and I would walk and I would say, oh Jesus, I love you, I love you, I love you. And tears would be coming down my face. I remember going into the woods and I said, Lord, I'm not leaving this woods until I know that your presence is for real. I want to experience you face to face like Moses did and mouth to mouth. And I would wait on the Lord an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. I would stay there and I would refuse to leave until Jesus came. And then Jesus would come and his presence would come and I'd weep in the woods. And I see Jesus, thank you. I remember years later when the Lord said, I'm calling you into another season of prayer and fasting. And I broke my leg. I broke my leg and I moved actually from one state to another state. And uh, they put a titanium rod inside of my leg and I couldn't preach. I couldn't do anything. I was just in pain. And I can remember I, was, I also had pain in my heart because I went through some stuff in church work, which is not always easy. And I had a broken heart and a broken leg, but I had a, a, a little chapel down in my basement that I set up. My wife helped me set it up. And I used to limp down into the little prayer chapel and I had bookshelves that would go across and I had this, like this sheet that was over like the door and I would creep inside. And I felt like I was in the holy of holies. And I had the soaking music, throne room music that was being played all the time, 24 seven, always playing that music. And I had thick carpet and I would sit there and I would walk with the Lord in there. And I felt like the Lord was sitting in there with me and I would cry to the Lord. I just tears coming down my face, just weeping to the Lord. And the Lord would keep me in that prayer room hours and hours. I can remember spending eight hours, nine hours, 12 hours in a day and, and day after day after day, spending hour after hour. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just, I'm bringing you to a point here in a second of hours and hours and hours of spending it with the Lord. And I spent over a year in that prayer room just seeking the face of the Lord. And finally, after two years of seeking the Lord and not doing any public ministry, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to start doing a video and recording it. And so I had this little generic camera to make a long story short. I started recording these videos and I called it the soaking place. In fact, you could watch some of them on our website. I still have some of them. And to my amazement, people started emailing in saying, I had an encounter with the Lord as I watched this. And I was so amazed by that. And then after two years, I got an invitation and an invitation to go into Ohio and speak in this little garage where I met this dear sister. Uh, amen. She drove all the way from Ohio to be here, our friend Oma. Wow. So make sure you give her a hug and... Yeah. Thank her for coming. But she was in those meetings. And I remember the first time that I stood up in those meetings to speak. And the presence of the Lord, I was nervous because I had not spoken in two years, but I had spent a lot of time with the Lord in his presence, just loving Jesus. And the spirit of the Lord came and there was a strong presence of the Lord there. And I could remember giving an invitation and every person that was there came forward. And the leader of that ministry 
His name was Mike. He said, you know, we've never seen this before. We've never seen every person get out of their seat and come forward. And then they put up a tent and we began to do tent meetings and I was there all summer. And from there, South Africa opened up and all these different places opened up and we began to minister and preach so many different places. And I had this fire on the inside of me and it lasted for years. And then I can remember probably 10 years after that, I felt as if, I, again, I felt like I needed something fresh. I needed a fresh bridal love for the Lord. I, I got tired being in ministry and doing this and doing that. And, and I realized that I wasn't as eager for the Lord as I once was as a young bride. And so I began to seek after the presence of the Lord once again in fasting and prayer. And I can remember uh, the enemy came the first night. To make a long story short, he came and he tried to paralyze me in my bed and I cried out to Jesus and the Lord immediately came and, and uh, sent the enemy packing and on his way. And the second night, the same thing happened. The enemy came in and paralyzed me in my bed. And I got excited because I knew that my prayer and my fasting was making a difference. Yeah. And then the third night, and I believe I've shared this testimony with you before, but again, I'm, I'm leading you. We're going on a journey tonight. This was not my original message that I had prepared to speak tonight. God's been changing it. So we're going to follow this. But the very third night, I went to sleep. I was actually on a couch. And I'll never forget just laying on that couch. And I was asleep. But then suddenly, I was awake. I knew that I wasn't sleeping. And I knew that I could not move a muscle. I couldn't even open my eyes. And I knew that Jesus had walked into the corner of the house. Jesus stepped into the living room. Now I know that you've heard testimonies before. And I've heard so many supernatural testimonies that sometimes it's caused me to doubt. Because I wonder, is someone exaggerating this? Or was it a dream? And I know that some exaggerate, but I believe that we will give an account for every word that we say. Right. So therefore, I would not exaggerate a testimony or embellish it or make it up. I'm telling you that Jesus walked through the corner of that house and into the living room. And his power was so strong and so powerful that I could not move a muscle. I could not even open my eyes. I wanted to, but I couldn't. For whatever reason, the Lord came with such power and such presence. I believe that the Lord was saying to me, I will not be outdone. The enemy came and paralyzed me. And I thought that his power was strong, but it was nothing compared to the power of God. And with his power came love. With his power came peace. With his power came strength and grace. It was, it was a powerful presence. Yes. Amen. And bells began to ring. I knew that there were bells on his garment. And I believe that the Lord, he had bells on his garment, excuse me, because he was coming as my high priest. Wow. Hmm. And he walked. I knew where he was, even though my eyes were closed. I knew where he was every moment in that living room. I knew that he was walking toward me. And I knew when he stood right in front of me. The Lord Jesus stood right in front of me and he reached down and he took one of my hands. When Jesus held my hands, it was like nothing that I've ever experienced before. And suddenly it was gone. My eyes opened up. I go, oh, what just happened? Jesus was just here. I heard bells ringing. There was a wind that was blowing through the living room. There was bells that were ringing. I knew that Jesus walked in and he stood right in front of me and he had one of my hands. And I said, oh, Jesus, I, I just, I, I hunger for you. I want more of you. I wanted him to come back inside. Yes. And immediately he came back. Boom. Eyes closed, wind blowing, bells ringing, came from the corner of the living room and began to walk across the living room floor. And this time he walked straight up to me and he stopped and he took both of my hands. Now this means something to me because my spiritual father, Wade Taylor, when I was 19 years old and I was a first year student in Bible school, 
I used to wait in line for several hours to get into his office. Always after dinner, there was always a line. And he took me to a special place and he took both of my hands. And he always prayed impartation. Stir up the gift that's been given you from the laying on of hands. Mm -hmm. And he prayed, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that Steve would have the ability to speak from his heart and that Steve would have the ability to write books. I could do neither. I could not speak publicly without stuttering and stammering. I had no anointing and I had no ability in the natural to speak whatsoever. And I could not write. I didn't even know what a pronoun was. I don't even know how I made it through high school because I certainly was not good with writing and I could never do it. But I knew that there was a fire. There was an impartation that was happening as way began to fan into flames yeah. through impartation into my life. Well, Jesus, my high priest, walked straight up to me and took my hands and he began to impart something to me. I believe one of the greatest things that he imparted to me was the impartation of bridal love. Amen. Because I can hardly speak a message without bringing up the bride. It's in me. It's in me. I sought the Lord and he came. Why? Because he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So all of these stories that I just told you from the woods to being in my little prayer room with the bookshelves, to being on the couch and Jesus holding my hands, were all seasons in my life where I lacked bridal love for the Lord, where I was busy running and doing things for God. But the same love that I had for, for him in the beginning, I didn't have. So I went into a season a prayer and fasting, asking the Lord for the more, that he would give me more love for him, more love for him. And the Lord began to impart that bridal intimacy to me. And I believe with all of my heart that what the Lord wants to do tonight is he wants to give you an impartation Amen. of bridal love. I'm not here to entertain you tonight. I'm not here to give you three points in a poem. I want something to shift on the atmosphere. I want something to shift on the inside of you for you to fall deeper in love with Jesus. Because I believe that there is a siren going off. There's a silver trumpet that's being blown. And it's the trumpet of bridal intimacy. Why? Because the Lord wants his bride to be in love with him because he's getting her ready to be used in the end time gathering of those that need to hear the gospel. He's preparing his bride. He's not coming back for a bride who's apathetic and lukewarm and self-centered and selfish. She's coming back for a bride who's in love with him. That's beaming yep, yep, yep. with love. Yes, Lord. That longs to be in his presence. That longs to shut off the television and say, it's all about you tonight, Jesus. I declare a holy feast. I'm going to feast at your table. I'm going to feast on your presence. I want to eat holy bread from the ovens of heaven. Amen. Oh, Jesus, it's all about you tonight, Jesus. And when our hearts begin to be a little bit apathetic and we get a little bit lazy, all of us do. I told you about the different seasons of my life where there were times where I, I got a little apathetic but I'm thankful that the Lord came running after me and he began to pull me into the secret place and he began to answer my heart's cry that he would give me more love for him. When was the last time that we asked the Lord for more love for him? Lord, give me more love for you. The same kind of love that I had in the beginning when I just got saved, Lord, give it to me again. That same love that caused me to pray and to fast in the beginning, to walk the floors of the church and refuse to stop praying because I wanted you. Lord, give me that kind of love once again for you. 
May I not just know you intellectually and not just know what you did years ago, but Lord, give me a fresh love. Come on, come on. Let there be a tsunami or a tidal wave of love that would come into my life that I would be a bride who's prepared and ready and in love with you. The Lord says, I remember how eager that you were to please me as a young bride long ago. How you loved me and even followed me through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord. I don't want the Lord to ever say to me, Steve, I remember how eager you were. I have taken a great deal of time and reflected on the scripture verse. I remember, Steve. I remember when the tears used to come down your face. I remember when you would sit there and your heart was so full of love you couldn't contain your emotions. I remember when you didn't think twice about fasting. I remember. I remember. How eager you were as a young bride. How much you ran after me. How much you desired me. How much you said, oh Jesus, I love you. I remember. I remember. It reminds me of a, a dear precious couple that maybe they were married for 70 years. And they used to sit at a park bench overlooking the water. Day after day and evening after evening, they would sit there together in love with each other, thinking about their kids and their grandkids and even their great-grandkids. All those Christmases and all those birthdays and all those special times, they would think about their wedding years and years ago. And then suddenly, the Lord calls one of them home. And then the other one sits on that park bench all alone, remembering all of those things. And he says, I remember. Pictures his wife. I remember. When she would smile at me. I remember when he would sing love songs to me. I remember. I remember. When there was such sweet intimacy. I remember. And the Lord says, to his church. I remember. Come on, come on. I remember. Where is your intimacy? Yes. Yes. Where is your desperation for me? Where is your hunger that you once had? I remember. We preach sermons with no desperation. We sing songs with no desperation. Not here in this church. We got a good church, but in general. The Lord says, I want to give you a fresh baptism of bridal love. He doesn't condemn you tonight if you're not as hot as you once were. He's just bidding you. He's bidding you. He's gently taking you by the hand and he's pulling you into the chambers. Do you see the sweet master coming for you? Yes. You see him taking you by the hands. Can you hear his voice say, come away with me, my love? For I desire to give you a fresh baptism of bridal love. I want to touch your heart that your heart would begin to burn for me once again. Because when your heart begins to burn for me like it once did, then that love that you have for me will be contagious and others will want what you have. For there is a great gathering of those that do not know God. And they will see Jesus in you. And they will want what you have because you have bridal love. If you're depressed, if you're confused, 
If you're exhausted, why would they want what you have? But when you go into the presence of the Lord, you go into the manifest presence and you lay at his feet and you receive a fresh baptism of bridal love for the Lord. You come out changed. You have a skip in your step, a twinkle in your eye, a desperation in your soul. And when you sing, there's a desperation. When you speak, there's a desperation. There's a pooling. I pray all the time, Lord, may my messages never become lifeless. May it pull people into the chambers of the king. Pull people into fresh intimacy with you, Lord Jesus. Therefore, God, I pray that you would not say over me tonight, Lord, I remember, Steve, because I don't want that. I, Lord, I want you to say, I found someone who loves me with all of their heart. I found a man after my own heart, a woman after my own heart. Someone that wants the courts of the Lord. Someone that wants to cast aside worthless idols. Someone that desires me more than anything else, more than the breath that they breathe, more than the water that they drink, more than the food that they eat. Someone that's desperately after me. I remember when that book, God Chasers, by Tommy Tenney hit the body of Christ. I believe it was in the 90s. It sparked something in the body of Christ. Everybody was talking about that pulpit that got split in two. And everyone began to chase after God. Can I say tonight that the Lord wants there to be a fresh chasing after him? Why? Why do we have to chase after God? I know we already have him, but why do we have to chase after him? Why do we have to be hungry? Why do we have to pursue him? Why doesn't God just come to us when we just say, come? Why is there any kind of pursuit to begin with? Why is there a, a chasing? Why does God hide? Well, he wants to know that you mean business. He's been so injured by so many that say, oh, Jesus, on a Sunday morning, I want you, Jesus. And they walk outside the door and they're absolutely unchanged. There you go. Yep. The last time that they said, Jesus, I want you, was the Sunday before. And the next time they'll say it will be the following Sunday, but there's no pursuit. Yeah. And so the Lord wants to know, do you mean business? <laughs> and so he stands back cautiously and he waits. Do they really want me? Is this something that's deep down inside of me? Yes, they want me. And he runs and he embraces the one. The one that loves him enough to pursue him. The one that loves him enough not to give him lip service. The one that loves him enough to bask in his very presence. We say we love God, but do we want to spend time with him? Do we want to invest time with him? I'm not talking about investing time with a picture on a wall. I have nothing against pictures. We have pictures. But there's something more than just a picture on a wall. There's a, there's a, a sweet master with eyes that blaze like fire that's sitting in a garden and he's waiting for his bride to come into the garden and to say, here I am. I don't want to leave. Just want to be with you. Sometimes the Lord convicts me. It brings that conviction. Because I, I could get so busy doing so many good things that sometimes I forget what's most important. And that's sitting with him in the garden. We will never be able to give to the great harvest of souls that's coming if we don't first have something to give. You cannot give that which you do not have. 
We must go into the presence of the Lord and receive that bridal intimacy once again so that we would not have a dead, lifeless religion or an obligation or a duty, but we would have something that's full of life full of presence, charging the very atmosphere. There was a dear sister, she passed away, but she really influenced a lot of people. Way Taylor was one of them. Her name was Hattie Hammond. Hattie Hammond. And Hattie Hammond was a girl evangelist who grew up to be a very elderly woman. Lived quite old. Carried something so special. And the only thing that she would have to do is stand there and begin to say, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. And when she said Jesus, it was like she was speaking of the closest of the closest friend. She didn't even have to shout Jesus. She just whispered him sometimes. And immediately the full atmosphere changed in the church. There was a mighty wind that began to flow and blow throughout the church. Lives were affected because there was an overflow of something that she had received in the garden of the Lord. Why did God move when she even began to say, Jesus because she said, Jesus, Jesus, millions of times, one-on-one -on -one with the Lord. So when she did that corporately, Jesus, she was speaking of a great friend that she knew personally. Oh, there you go. Yes. yes, absolutely. And his feet began to move in her direction. And everybody else got the overflow of the relationship that Hattie Hammond had with the Jesus. Amen. You must, you must. Get that bridal intimacy because there's a world in Du Bois. There's a world in Pennsylvania. There's a world in Texas. A world in Tennessee that need what you have. That when you would grab a hold of their hands and begin to pray, they would know that there's something different. You would have something to give. There would be an electricity and a presence and a power that would be released because you have been spending so much time in bridal intimacy with the Lord, that there's this overflow of his presence. I would so speak to their hearts. Hallelujah. We don't run after the Lord to get something. Lord, I'm spending time with you because I want to have the power to zap people. We go to him just because. Back in the late 90s, I was taking a walk and I was walking on this trail in the woods and the Lord said, I'm just because God. I'm a just because God. And I said, what's that? And he says, I'm looking for people that will come to me just because. Not for what I can do for them, but just because they love me just because they want to spend time with me, just because they adore me, just because they want to worship me, just because. When God finds someone that will come to him just because, they will begin to be carriers of that bridal intimacy automatically. And an overflow will touch people's lives. You're not doing it so that it will touch other people's lives. The only thing you have to do is walk in a room and the atmosphere changes. The days of having to brag and tell everybody how anointed you are, that is coming to an end. In the end times, the Lord will have a bride who's radiant, who's brilliant, who's shining bright because she's been in the glory of the Lord. She's so in love with Jesus so in love with him that that brightness of love, that bridal intimacy is just shining everywhere she goes. And others are like, their eyes are fixed, going, what's up with that person? They're different. 
They're not just talking religion. There's something different. They won't even be able to communicate what it is about you, but they'll know there's something. There's something different about you. You're not like everybody else. You want to know what it is? Bridal intimacy. I believe that the message of the hour is bridal intimacy because the Lord is preparing his bride for the final finale. Yes. Amen. You will not have a bride who's apathetic. You will not have a bride who's content. You will not have a bride who measures things with a cup. But they go and they drink from the reservoirs of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, I like reading about the churches because there's a message in every one of the churches for us. There have been times I've been privileged to be able to teach verse by verse, Revelation 1, 2, 3, and 4. There's so much in here. And I don't get offended by the things that I read that the church needs to improve. I believe I need to improve. So if I see something when the Lord says, well, I have this against you, I'm not offended by that. I like that. I often tell the Lord, fix me. If there be, search my heart, if there be anything on the inside of me that's hindering the move of the Spirit in my life, are, are causing me not to be able to flow like you want me to flow in these end times, tell me, Lord, scrub me, clean me in Jesus' name. And so we see that he says something over the church of Ephesus. And it says in verse number two, I know all the things that you do. I'm reading it on the New Living Translation because it's much easier to understand this. It says, I have seen your hard work and your patience, your endurance. So he's saying something very positive here about their endurance and their patience. I know you don't tolerate evil people. So they had a standard. There was a standard that they had. They knew what sin was. They didn't like it. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not, so they had discernment. You have discovered that they are liars. They knew the fruit. Verse number three. You have patiently suffered for me. So they, had a, they were willing to suffer. They had so many good things without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. So there was something that they could improve. Uh, I believe that if I stood before the Lord right now, that he would have a list of things that I've done really, really well. And he may have a couple things that I need to improve on. And I want him to tell me those things now. Yeah. I, know. I want the Lord to tell me those things now that I need to improve on. Is there anything that's hindering my bridal love, Jesus? Is there anything? He says, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen from your first love. Turn back to me again and work as you did at first. If you don't, I will come and remove your lampstand. So it talks about different things. So it speaks about two things here, about their love for him and their love for others. I told you that there are two trumpets that are sounding right now. I've come to sound the alarm. The first one is bridal intimacy. He's calling the bride of Christ into bridal intimacy. Something fresh. Returning to their first love. So that he would never say, I remember. I remember. I don't want him to say I remember over my life. I don't want to be like the church of Ephesus that's become status quo with the love. But he mentioned something else, and this is the second siren that I believe. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. You don't love me, bridal intimacy, first siren, or love each other. The second silver trumpet that's being 
blasted throughout the land is the trumpet of loving others, receiving a love for people. I can remember I gave a message. In fact, I gave it in this church. So I think I was with Kevin when we did a conference here. And I talked about how some people use their ministry for the people and other people use people for their ministry. Some people use their ministry for the people and some people, they use people. They use people for their ministry. And the Lord says, in the end times, I will have a bride that genuinely has compassion and loves my bride, loves my people, loves the lost ones in the streets, cares that people are going hungry. I've seen some in the body of Christ, they've lost that sense of love for others. They don't care. Somebody's starving, well, what do they do to deserve that? And they walk right on by Somebody messes up, makes a mistake, rather than tries to then try to restore that person with love. They're like, well, they got what they deserve, and they just go right on. Some Christians even rejoice when ministers fall. Well, yeah, I hope he learns his lesson. Blah, 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 blah. We should weep. We should weep for his family. Weep for the lost ones. Weep for his church. We should fast and pray. Seek God. Have love. I believe in the end times with all of my heart that the Lord is giving his bride a fresh love for people once again. How can we win the world during the great harvest of souls if we don't even love them? Lord, give me a burning, burning desire to love people. I asked the Lord once because I realized that my prayer life was very self-centered. I was always telling the Lord, Lord, this is on my heart right now. I need you to fix this, Lord. I, I'd have my list of things I needed him to do and change. And, and there's nothing wrong with that word to petition the Lord. But one day I realized I never ask the Lord if something was on his heart. It never even occurred to me. I always shared my heart. I did all the talking in the relationship. How many people know that a good relationship both people share? If you have a friend that does all the talking and could care less about anything that you're going through, how long are you friends? If you have a friend that does all the giving, always, 100%, you're always the giver in the relationship, and they're always the taker, how long do you have a relationship? How much intimacy can you really have with another person if it's always about them? Well, I realized something. That I had never asked the Lord if there was anything on his heart. I wanted it to be about him, not just me. I wanted to be a good friend to the Lord. Good friend. And a good friend cares about the other. And I know he's God and I'm a little ant. But if I couldn't, if I couldn't as that little ant to let him know that I care about him, could I not touch his heart? And so I said, is there anything on your heart, Father? And he said, child pornography is on my heart. Child abortion is on my heart. Child abuse is on my heart. All three things that the Lord said had to do with children. And immediately, I felt a burden. It was a heavy burden. It was an intercessory burden. And I began to wrestle in prayer. I was on my knees. 
I was a snotty mess on the carpet, wrestling in prayer, praying that God would come and that he would do something to save those children, that he would end abortion, that that, that woman that's walking toward that clinic right now would change your mind, that that, that child that's scared in the corner because they're going to get abused, that that man would stop. And as I prayed for a long time, suddenly there was a lifting. And I realized that I had prayed clear through that I had wrestled in prayer with the Lord and that he had shared his heart with me. He gave me a burden for those children. He gave me a burden for people that were hurting. I could see them in my spirit. And see, we can have that intimacy with the Lord where he gives us bridal love, but he also gives us a love for people that are suffering, that we care about what he cares about, that we care about what he suffers with. The king of the universe actually feels pain. Yes, he does. The Holy Spirit can be grieved and quenched. Jesus wept over Jerusalem hard tears. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. Our father can be hurt by what he sees. And I want to be close enough to the father that I would care about those things. And that he would give me a love for people once again. So I believe right now, now we're back to the conclusion. That God is giving a love a bridal intimacy for those that are hungry for it because they realize that they're not as hungry and thirsty as they once were in the very beginning. And he's also giving a hunger and a thirst to love people. You know, one of the greatest examples to me, there's role models, is my wife. My wife and I, we've been married 26 years. And uh, we have two daughters. One's 24. The other's going to be 22. We just found out less than a couple weeks ago. Some of you already know, but we're going to be grandparents. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. First time grandparents. Grandpa, Grandpa Steve. Grandpa. Oh. <laughs> Grandpa Steve. <laughs> oh, Grandpa Steve. <laughs> he doesn't even have gray hair and he's a grandpa. <laughs> but all these years, my wife has been a strong supporter of the ministry. And she's come with me and I, I do much better when my wife's with me. I love when my wife comes with me. Some people like to ditch their wives, not me. We like to be together 24-7. We don't get tired of each other. We don't get bored with one another. We enjoy being with each other. And my wife has been an inspiration to me because of her love for people. You won't always see her up preaching. She has given messages, but that's not something that she does a lot. She's very shy. But there's one gift that she has that shines brighter than any other gift that, she, that I have ever seen her operate in, and that's her love for people. She has worked in nursing homes her entire life. And anytime we would travel and speak somewhere, including Du Bois, sometimes I would tell Diane, share your nursing home stories. And my wife would share how she would be and of course, this doesn't look like my wife, but it's symbolic of my wife. She would be on the side of a bed when somebody in the nursing home was getting ready to pass. And sometimes they were the meanest one in the nursing home. Didn't know the Lord. And at the very last minute, my wife 
would be the Lord's hands extended. And she would take their hand and they would pray the sinner's prayer. And they would receive Christ as Savior. And I told her that you need to write a book about that. And she did. This is the cover of it. But I'm not telling you that to sell a book. I'm telling you that to say that my wife's special gift of being Christ's hands extended has been such an inspiration to me. Because when we love each other and when we love people that may even not be able to love us back, the Lord sees it. Look how happy that he is. Truth is, that was the third Jesus face. Every time one of the artists that we had would do, like, mm. we're about 75% happy with that one. He at least got the smile. And the Lord smiles when you love people. The church of Ephesus forgot that. They forgot about that bridal intimacy, about looking up. The Lord's calling his bride up. And they also forgot about loving that one next to them. But the Lord called them into that deeper relationship. And he's blowing the trumpet right now. And he's saying, I'm making available to you a bridal intimacy that I desire to place deep inside of your heart for me. That same love that you had in the beginning of your ministry or the beginning of your walk with God, I want to give it to you. And then he's also saying, I want to give you a fresh love for people and a compassion for the lost. Why? Because. Because. We are to be a part of the great harvest of souls. And if we're going to be a part of the great harvest of souls, then we have to love Jesus with all of our hearts and love our brother as ourselves. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I believe, Lord, tonight that you desire to do that which I could not do. And that's to touch a heart deep down inside of somebody's heart and give them that hunger that hunger to love you afresh and to give us that hunger to love our brothers and sisters, those that are easy to love and those that are hard to love, those that are like us and those that are completely the opposite of us. Lord, I thank you tonight you're going to give us a love for your people once again. Lord, break our heart with things that break your heart. Let it bother us, Lord, when people go to hell. Let it bother us when people are hurt and devastated. And Lord, may we be Christ's hands extended to a world that desperately needs you. Father, touch hearts in Jesus' name. Tonight, if you want a fresh bridal intimacy and or you want a fresh love for your brothers and sisters as a step of faith I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and meet me here in the front and I'm going to pray I won't keep you long. I know we have a service tomorrow. I'm going to spend more time praying for people tomorrow. But I just want to wrap it up with just praying a prayer for those that want more bridal intimacy 
as well as those that want fresh love for their brothers and sisters. If you want that, meet me here in the front. In Jesus' name.